Wow. All right. You know, I love that we have a little bit of room here to put my stuff on because a lot of times I go and teach somewhere and I, I like to spread out and I have a little music stand. It's kind of what they have there. But if you come to our church, it's just a little bit bigger than this. I got I to gotta spread out. But I'm uh, really, really glad to be here again. My name is Dave. This is my lovely bride, Mindy, um, also known as Nana and Papa. Okay, we have three grandsons. We have another one on the way in about two weeks. And then we found out another one of our kids is pregnant and is due in like January. So soon to have five, Lord willing. And so we're praying for that. And so uh, so she is Nana, I am Papa. I wanted Sensei, but apparently these things are voted on. I got the kibosh, whatever, you know. So I was... Uh, I thought I knew exactly what I was going to teach here tonight for weeks. Knew exactly what I was going to do. And uh, I wanted to do apologetics. I wanted to teach on false teachers and uh, things like that. And then uh, last night, God just kind of changed everything around. So I am going to teach on a false teaching. But I do want to let you know that, um, that I do have a series under Second Peter. So I'm going to show this slide right here. This is our website. And if you would like to know more about false teachers, such as the emergent church and postmodernism, I spent two weeks doing that in Second Peter. So you can go to the website, you go to teachings, you hit the view list and, and go down to where we, uh, we, we taught in Second Peter. You click on that and you'll be able to see nine weeks of false teachers. I went over three weeks with the... Um, I'm sorry, three weeks for the Emergent Church and Pope's Modernism, two weeks with uh, Prosperity Gospel, another two weeks with the New Apostolic Reformation Movement. Um, I spent one week over some authors that are false teachers, such as w William P. Young, The Shack, Stay Out of the Shack, okay? Um, and there's another one. I'm going to step on some toes, I bet. The Jesus Calling, false. Don't do it. It's New Age all the way. I spent a whole Sunday just on that book alone, okay, to show you the New Age teachings that are there. She got this from the God Calling, and the God Calling, the person who wrote that, guess what? New Age occultists. Why, why, would, you, why would you draw your information from that, you know? So, um, also another one, okay, Anne Voskamp. Mm -mm. Ladies, no, no, Thousand Reasons, Broken Way. The way she eroticizes her relationship with the Lord, absolutely not. Spent time on that. Mark Batterson's The Circle Maker. Honey The Circle Maker. Are you kidding me? It's ridiculous. You know, went over that as well. And so if you're interested in any of that, you can go uh, on our website and you can get uh, download all that kind of stuff. If, uh, so, But this evening, God took me in a different direction to a specific teaching that has kind of crept into the church recently over the next... Uh, last three years. It needs to be kicked out of the church. We'll get to that here in a moment. But just like anything else, don't believe me. Just because I told you some stuff, don't believe me. I want you to be like the Brians in, in Acts chapter 17. Verse 10, it says, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And th these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness, searching the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Whatever I tell you here tonight, yeah, you have a Bible. Check it out. Is what I'm saying true? You should never just receive at face value what someone says. You should always have a Bible. You should follow along. One of the fun things I like to do uh, when I was going through the false teachers, like the prosperity gospel and all that uh, word of faith movement, I, I have little snippets of Joel Osteen. I said, let's just listen to it. Okay, he says something, he kind of quotes a verse, but he doesn't really quote the verse. And I said, okay, let's stop right here. Let's go to the verse. Does it say what he just said? No, it does not. And then you could do that with every single one of his teachings. When he quotes a verse, it's usually 90% of the time, it is absolutely out of context. And so I'll throw it up there. You hear what he has to say? He quoted this verse. Let's see how well he did. And we would go to it and say, oh, that's not what that means at all, especially in its context. And so you can kind of go through it that way. And so again, Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. They're going to look like us. They're going to sound like us. They're going to have probably a Bible with them. Okay. But guess what? They're false prophets. Paul warned us in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This is one of the reasons why I take this very, very seriously, is because God purchased the church with his own blood. And by the way, in Acts 20, verse 28, that we just cited there, that's the mic drop to be able to prove that Jesus is God. That's the mic drop. So when Jehovah Witnesses come your way, come knocking, go straight there. Say, explain this to me, where it says right here that to shepherd the church of God, it's called the church of God, which he purchased, who? God. How? With his blood. How did God purchase the church with his blood unless Jesus is God? Boom. Boom. Mic drop, walk away, you won the argument, okay? Because grammar tells us right there, which he purchased, he means God. And he purchases what, what? His own blood. When did God come down from heaven to purchase the church with his blood? Through his son, Jesus Christ, that's who. It's, it's the only thing that can make sense. You, you can't go in a different direction. Right there, boom, mic drop. He goes on to say, for I know this, that after my departure, Paul says, Savage wolves will come in among you, among you, not even on the outside. That's going to happen as well. But among you, someone's going to be raised up and they're going to, and they're actually going to be a wolf. Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. Remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He would go on and talk to Timothy. And he would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.1, I charge you there before God. This is my witness. God is my witness. I'm handing this charge over to you. You are now going to receive this charge. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Not opinion, not color for stories, you know, not what your opinion is or what you think of this. It's kind of like saying the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort. With all long suffering and teaching, I am going to hopefully be able to convince you here convince you, exhort you of this false teaching and why it's false according to the word of God, not Dave Love, okay? According to the word of God. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Really? Prosperity gospel? God wants to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, who doesn't want to hear that? Tickling of the ears. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear more of that, how I can get wealthy. I want to hear more of that, how I can always be healed. I want to know more about that, about how God just wants to bless me now. This is your best life now. Wow. When I read the word of God, as a Christian, I have heaven awaiting me. How could this be the best life now unless you're not a believer in Jesus Christ? And if you're not truly saved, then you're right. This is the best life now. God's word, God's word. Let's bring it back to that. They have itching ears. The word itching there actually means tickle. It's a tickling of the ears. There's this uh, emergent church woman by name of Phyllis Tickle. Are you kidding me? And she will tickle your ears to think that God is emerging and showing other things other than his word here. It's ridiculous. It's, it's kind of like she was called out right here. You know, Phyllis Tickle. And they will heap up themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth, be turned aside to fables. Now, I want you to go to the book of Judas. Where is that? 
the book of Judas. Yeah, you should make sure that these things are so. You know, th wait, say that again. You know of a Jude. But did you know that the book of Jude, in the original, the name is Judas? Why? Because it's Jesus' brother, isn't it? And he has a brother named Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, which is one of the reasons why they chose not to continue on with that name. But through the ages, they changed it. Go, oh, that kind of freaks people out. So let's just call it Jude. Okay? But I want you to go to Jude. All right? Why don't you go to the book of Jude? I don't need to tell you what chapter. I'm going to let you figure that out. But it's right before the book of Revelation there. Book of Jude, verse 3. Look what Jude says here. He's, about, he's writing a letter, okay? This is, um, uh, Jude is actually Eudas or Judah, or Judas, it means you shall be praised. Um, and so here he's writing this letter, and it says in verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I want to talk to you about our salvation. I want to talk to you about how blessed this salvation is. Everything that the Lord has done, we need to focus in on this common salvation that we have in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what I want to talk about, he says. Yet, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So I wanted to talk about this, but I've been impressed to talk about contending for the faith. Why? Verse 4, certain men have crept in unnoticed long ago, who were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude wanted to talk about something else, but because of this crisis of these false teachers at this time, he kind of had to switch gears to encourage his readers to contend earnestly for the faith. I believe that's kind of what I have to do here tonight is to contend for the faith over a very specific false teaching called critical race theory. We're going to get to that. But up until that point, I need to build a case of why the word of God is sufficient and what God has called us to do, okay? I want you to go to Philippians chapter 1. Go over here to Philippians chapter 1. What I love about the book of Philippians and why it's different than any other letter that Paul wrote is that this is the only letter that is actually a thank you letter. Did you know that? Philippians is a thank you letter. It is Paul thanking the Philippian believers for when nobody else would give on his account of what he was going through, they did. They gave. And so in chapter four, at the very end, it talks about thank you so much that when I was in need, you're the only one that came to my aid. And, and so Philippians is actually a thank you letter for them for the way that they've always come alongside the Apostle Paul. Anyway, he goes on and says here in verse 8, For God is my witness, chapter 1, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. That is my prayer for you guys here tonight, that your love may abound more and more, that it would abound more in knowledge and in discernment. Why? Verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent and that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. We are called to be discerning. We have to know the word of God so we can build ourselves up in the word of God so when false teachings come into the church, we go, wait a minute, that does not measure up to the word of God. And we're going to see that when it comes to critical race theory. Now, I know we just bounced around a whole bunch of different places. We're actually now going to go into the text that we're going to go over here tonight. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, okay? 
Ephesians chapter, and don't, don't get me wrong, we're not done bouncing around. <laughs> if you've gone to our fellowship long enough, that we should be called the church of bounce around. I mean, we, we jump around to different scriptures. Why? Because scripture interprets scripture. That's why. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul wants to give us a quick little reminder of who we were before knowing Christ. It's, it's always a great thing to be able to go back. Do you remember when, before you knew Christ? Do you remember when, in your lost condition? Do you men, remember when you were dead in your trespasses and sins? It's always good to remember. It's never good to dwell on that. Just remember that, okay? But it's never good to dwell on that. So he says in verse 1, and you he made alive. He's talking to believers, the Ephesian believers. He says, you he made alive, meaning God, but you were dead in trespasses and sins. He made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. This is... This is why every now and then, because God did it with me, I'll, I'll hear another brother or sister being down on someone because of how they're living their life or whatever. And I go, wait a minute, are they, are they a believer? Well, no. So, so for some reason, you can't believe that this pagan is living like a pagan. Are you kidding me? Do you remember when before you became a believer? Well, well yeah. Weren't you a pagan? Yeah. And weren't you doing those same things? Well, yeah. Okay. The difference is you now know Christ. So why would you expect the pagan to have this upright moral behavior and be nice and kind and, and whatever it is that you might think that they're supposed to do? They don't know Jesus. So, you know, get off your high horse and understand that they're just acting the way they should without knowing Jesus, the way that we all did before we knew Jesus. And so he goes and he said, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. The prince of the power of the air is none other than Satan himself, the devil. Satan's desire is that you walk according to the course of this world. Satan could care less whether you worship him or not. All he wants to make sure is that you don't worship God, that you don't come to Jesus. That's all he cares about. He doesn't care whether you worship him. If he can get you to follow this Maharishi over here or this person over here or, or Buddha or this, whatever, he, he doesn't care. Or just the world or atheism. I don't believe there's any God at all. Or very secular. He doesn't care. Those are all wiles of the devil. That's all his scheme to distract you away from the one truth. And that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. In Ephesians 5, 6, it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, quick little understanding of what it is to be dead in your trespasses and sins before you came to know the Lord and, and you were awakened to who he is and him coming inside of you and giving you new life and things like that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we read, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it says spirit first, then soul and body. Now, don't we usually have it the other way? Body, soul, and spirit. Don't we usually kind of go in that when people want to talk about that? Oh, let's talk about the body, soul, and spirit. Okay, but here... The only place it's really mentioned, it says spirit, soul, and body. And I would submit to you the reason why it's in that order is because whoever controls the spirit is going to control the soul and the body in that order. Just like God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, since we are created in the image of God, we are also a triune being. And hence, we are spirit, soul, and body. Soul is not the same as the spirit. But I'm here to tell you that the soul is in the spirit. Dave, how do you know that? Scripture, Hebrews 4, verse 12. It's going to be up here on the screen so you can check my work. 
For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. Notice how they equate soul and spirit with joint and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Marrow is in the joints, just like the spirit would be inside the soul. It's, it's, it's labeled that way so you can draw that conclusion, okay? So just as marrow is in the joints, so is the spirit inside the soul right there. The word spirit in the Greek is a Greek word named, called pneuma. It means spirit, Holy Spirit, or breath of God, the pneuma, the breath of God. The word soul is suke. It's where we get the word psych. It's also uh, the place of the mind, the conscience is here, your emotions, your feelings, your desires. You relate to people through your soul. That's my soulmate. We desire the same thing. We feel the same way and that's your soul, okay, that has all those emotions. The body is just that. It's, it's the outside. It's just physical, okay, it, it, and, and that's called soma, okay, and so we relate uh, in this world through our five senses through the body. Things like sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch. So we have these five senses, not to be confused with the five senses. Mr. Miyagi, who, what movie is that from? Karate Kid, right? What about Master Splinter? There you go. Ninja Turtles. There you go. We got a fan back there. There you go. And then we also have Master Shifu. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. The younger generation knows that one. And then I'll just see if the lame generation knows this one. Master Rex. Come on. Bring it. There you go. There we go, Napoleon Dynamite. There you go, Master Rex, yeah. But the best one of all has to do with Star Wars. Uh, Obi-Wan. Nope. Master Yoda. That's exactly right, Master Yoda. You know, I had a, um, uh, I had a, uh, a very old Greek man that came to our church years and years ago uh, in Littleton. He was five foot two. And he was a Greek man. When he first started coming, he was 91 years old. And he spoke seven different languages. He was one of the first ones to translate the word of God into Farsi. Brilliant. Knew seven languages. Has been walking with the Lord since he was 16. And he chose to come to our church. And I called him my spiritual Yoda. <laughs> Actually, I think the very first time I met him, he kind of said, much to learn you have. You know, as he <laughs> kind of took me under his wing. You know, I said, oh, all right. Well, probably do, you know. You're as old as Moses, so probably, you probably, you know. So the spirit is actually how we relate to God. The spirit is how we relate to God. The heart, the mind, that, that's all about the soul, thinking and feeling, stuff like that. So you might recall that in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, that God told and put man in the garden. It says in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. They ate of it. Did they die? They did spiritually. They did spiritually. I want you to look at this slide right here. That's right. That's a good slide right there, too, the Word of God. I like that. Tell me when you get that. There we go. Look at that. Body, soul, spirit is there in the middle. As you can see with the body, the five senses right there, taste, touch, smell, hearing, sight. The soul, that's your personality. That's your conscience. Your emotions, your will, your mind is there. And then your spirit how we interact with God, it's either dead or alive. Kind of reminds me of that song. I'm a cowboy. 
on a steel horse I ride, and I'm wanted, wanted. Bunch of heathens. Why do you even know that song? <laughs> wow. Jeff, you have a lot of work, man. Should not have known that song. I, I know you didn't. I, I Yeah. So, as you can see from the middle there, the spirit, if it's controlled by God, that it will affect the soul, which will affect the body. So, when you receive Jesus, things start happening there, okay? Um, the world will tell you what? Follow your heart. What horrible advice. Follow your emotions, Follow your heart. Well, what does the Bible says? The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Only God can. And yet the world says, follow your heart. No, don't do that. Desperately wicked. It wants wrong things. How many people have heard the, the expression, well, the heart wants what the heart wants? Uh, okay, that's not good. You know, the prisons are filled with people who did things that they felt they were supposed to do. It's not a good thing to do. It's not good at all. And so as an unbeliever, it is your soul that controls the body. As a believer, it is the Holy Spirit that is now supposed to come inside of you and now lead and guide you. In Ephesians 2, when we just read, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Well, dead is not your body. It's very much alive. It desires what it desires. It's not your soul. It has to mean spirit. And yes, left to yourself, guess what? You and I would never seek God. I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I, I I talk to people all the time of a different persuasion that wants to say, hey, you're, yeah, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. There's nothing you can do about there. There's none righteous, no, not one. And I always say, yes, and left to ourselves, no one would pursue God. But praise God, he does not leave us to ourselves. He is constantly pursuing us. He's constantly showing us through our body, our senses, as well as our soul, that he is God. How does he do that? Right here in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, how can you suppress something you do not have? Everybody has the truth in him or her, and it's dormant until God stirs it up. How does he do that? Keep reading. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For how did he do that? Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Creation. Because of creation, because God shows you creation, that stirs up in you the truth that if there's creation, there has to be a what? Creator. Has to be. Why? Because of complexity, that's why. And design. You don't come into the, uh, you, you don't go hiking in the, in the mountains and all of a sudden stumble upon a watch and go, wow, look at that. Over millions of years, look how this got put together. No, you look at the watch, you see the complexity of the watch, and you come to the conclusion, which is only reasonable, there is a watch maker. Here we're told, you see the stars? Just think that just happened by chance? The complexity of the universe just happened by chance? Reason tells you 
No way. And God stirs your heart by the things which are clearly seen, the things which are made. What? His eternal power, God had. So you're without excuse. God's shown it to you. The truth is inside of you. You're, you're suppressing it. You can't suppress something you don't have. And he makes that very clear because also, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so they chose to believe the lie of their own vain imagination. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, by hearing the word of God. See, because God's been stirring up your heart, because there's creation, there has to be a creator. Okay, because his invisible attributes are clearly seen, you see the creation, you see, the, you know something is greater than yourself, so that when someone comes along and they're preaching the word, then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, because God has already awakened the truth inside of you, that there is a God, he has shown it to you in his creation. Now when someone comes along, starts preaching the gospel, you're going, that makes sense. Oh, I get that now. And so everybody is capable of receiving the gospel, the good news that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of mankind. When you receive Jesus, guess what? The Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Where does he reside? And we can say, well, your whole being, I get that. But it's really now going back to where the spirit once was, there in the middle there of the spirit. And this is why now, for the very first time, you have a war going on inside of you. For the longest time, you've been doing what your flesh wants to do. And now there's this spirit there showing you a different way. And guess what? Whatever you feed more is going to win out in those battles. You feed the spirit more. When the, when the crossroads come, do I go flesh or spirit? You'll go spirit because you've been feeding the spirit. You've been in the word. You've been in prayer. Okay, you're involved in your church. You're doing what it is that the Lord is calling you to do. And you're gleaning from other people as well. And you're growing in your knowledge and, and the spirit of the Lord. And so you are able to make those decisions. But even though you're a believer, you can still choose not to do what you know God wants you to do. And you can still feed the flesh. And so when those crossroads come, that fork in the road, spirit, do what God says or what your flesh does, you keep doing what the flesh does. Why? Because you've been feeding that. You haven't been in the word. You've been watching TV. You've been reading about the philosophy of the world and you're filling yourself with all this stuff of the world and the world's getting stronger in you. You're still a believer in the Lord. Your salvation hasn't left, but you're not gonna have a, victory, a victorious life doing what God has called you to do. And so you have this battle and that's for a different time. Now, going back to Ephesians. I told you we bounce around, but now we're back in Ephesians. Look what it says in verse 4, Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. It was God who made us love, alive. How? Through Christ. Through the riches of his mercy. That great reservoir that God has of mercy, he used by sending his son Jesus the Christ to die for the sin of mankind, paying the penalty for our sin. Mercy is not getting what we deserve, which is death and hell. That's what we deserve. But because of his mercy, we don't get that because Jesus paid the price for that. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, heaven. We don't deserve heaven, but he's given that to you. Mercy and grace, the mercy God gives us through his son to pay the penalty of our sin, his great love towards us. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He also says that even though we were dead, he made us alive. He has raised us up together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here today, he's speaking of all of us that have received Jesus that positionally, even though not in reality of now time and space, but positionally, 
Because you have received Jesus, that is such a done deal, and no one can change that, it speaks in past tense that because you've received Jesus, your position is going to be in heaven, and because that's so sure, it's spoken of, you're already there. Positionally speaking, you're already there. Nobody can change that. So it's spoken of in the past tense. That's how sure God wants you to understand that you will be in heaven someday. And I love that language of that. Now, a quick little side note. There's no quick side notes with me. But anyway, a quick side note here of God's great love that I hope I do. I hope this blows your mind. Okay, I hope this blows your mind. You can great, gain great insight you can see the actual fingerprints of God on his word when you do things like word studies. You can gain this great insight of God when you do word studies and you try and look at, and it doesn't work every time, but there's quite a few that it does. Love is one of them, that when you look up the very first time that's mentioned in the Bible, it's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. It's always great to kind of think of these Great buzzwords that we see all through God's word, whether it's grace or mercy or whatever it is. When, when's the first time that's used? Grace, the very first time grace is used is with Noah. Genesis 6, 6, Noah found grace in God's eyes. That's the first time that grace is used. Grace is undeserved favor. So he found undeserved favor. And that's the first time that's used in Genesis 6, 6. Mercy, first time that's used, Genesis 19, 19. When Lot is speaking of God's mercy and saving him from the destruction of Sodom. Okay, that's, that's a good place. Faith. Faith. That's a great Bible word. It's a foundational word of your faith in God and the Lord Jesus Christ and everything else. It is used 229 times in the Bible. Of that 229 times, how many times is it used in the Old Testament, take a guess. Th th those are poor guesses. <laughs> 229 times in the whole Bible, how many times in the Old Testament do you think? Just throw out a number. 10, you're the closest. Closer? No. <laughs> two. Two times. Faith is only used two times in the Old Testament. How crazy is that? The interesting thing is the very first time it's used, Deuteronomy. 20, uh, chapter 32, verse 30, where it's used in a negative where God's kind of rebuking his people for not having faith in him. The second time is a very, very famous verse that we see in Romans, and but it's in Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by what? Those are the only two times it's used in the Old Testament. That's nuts. If, if you don't do these words today, I would never have guessed that. If someone said, Dave, how many times faith is in the Bible? I don't know, 500 times. That's eh, 229. Okay, so I'm thinking 100 times in the Old Testament, maybe 129 in the New Testament. No, twice. The other 227 times is all in the New Testament. What about the word hope? Do you know that the word hope doesn't even appear in the first five books of the Bible? Hope doesn't even show up until the book of Ruth. Would you have guessed that? I, I'm just here to tell you that um, it was during uh, COVID that I was, I, was, uh, I was going over, I think it was Psalm 31, and it says to hope in the Lord, and I just kind of looked up that word, what hope meant. And it is the Hebrew word tikva. And the word hope means cord. It means Attachment is what the word means. Think about that. Hope means a cord or a rope or an attachment. And you wonder why we read so often, like in Psalm 119, 114, you're my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Think about that. I am tied to, tethered, attached to your word, which is why you're my hiding place and my shield. Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. All you who hope, tethered to, tied to, attached 
to the Lord. Makes sense, doesn't it? Why do, we, why do we hope in the Lord? Because we're attached to the Lord. That's why. Jeremiah 17, 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord, who's tethered to him, tied to him, attached to him. If you're attached to the Lord, great is your hope. Great is your hope. And so when you do these word studies, you kind of go, wow, that is blowing my mind. These are all Christian words that we think we're going to see in the very first three chapters of Genesis. And yet they show up later on. Well, it's the same thing with love. When is the first time love used in the Bible? It is Genesis. But it's Genesis 22. And it's used in a very, very peculiar manner. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there's this Bible principle called the principle of first mention that, that when, um, when it occurs the first time in the Bible, it usually has significance. And in its context, which it occurs, it kind of sets a pattern for its primary usage and development through the rest of scripture. So that first time you see it sometimes can lead you to understand that is what the understanding should be as you use this word throughout the entirety of scripture, unless the context says otherwise. But this is kind of like the basis of it. Knowing then, I want you to go over here to Genesis 22. What on earth is going on in Genesis 22 that we have the first word love? It's when Abraham is about to sacrifice his son. Look what it says here in chapter 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. I want you to take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. First mention of love in the Bible. Now I was somewhere else when I taught on that and I had a, uh, I had like about an eight-year-old little boy that had a different version. And he said, actually, the first time love is mentioned is in chapter 4 of Genesis, my Bible says. I said, really? And he says, he says, yeah, Adam loved Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And I said, well, actually, the word there is new. It's not, it's not love. You have the never intended version. And that's why it says that. But it's supposed to say that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And he says, well, what does new mean? And I said, it means you need to ask your parents. <laughs> That's kind of how we left that. But in the original, love is actually in verse 2 here of, of Genesis chapter 22. Now take your son, your only son, Isaac. Well, is Isaac his only son? No. What about Ishmael? Irrelevant. God is talking about the only son of the promise. Okay. And so, um, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah. Well, according to 2 Chronicles 3.1, the land of Moriah is where Solomon built the temple. So we know Mount Moriah is what? Jerusalem. But I want you to go there and offer him up as a burnt offering. And on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Interesting. Here you have the first mention of love in the Old Testament. It's in reference to a father's love for his son. Sound familiar? Abraham, I, we, we're going through Genesis. We just got done with Genesis 28. Just so you know, we've been in Genesis for a year and a half. We go deep. So... Just got done with chapter 28, but here, okay, we know that there's things called typology, that it's quite obvious if anybody doesn't believe in typology, I said, you got to just be quiet for a second. You need to let me take you through chapter 22 and let me show you all the things that it's obvious that Abraham is a type of the father. Isaac is the type of the son to which 2,000 years later, God is going to offer his only son. So he's acting out something that's going to take place in the future. Okay, so th there, there's a typology here. And so this first typology, when it comes to the word love, is a father's love for his son. Okay, now the interesting thing is, 
when you get into the New Testament, when is the first word love used there in the New Testament? Well, in Matthew, just like it is in Mark, just like it is in Luke, it has to do when Jesus is baptized. And in Matthew 3.17, it says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, love, Ahav, in whom I am well pleased. Mark 1.11, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Luke 3.22, You are my beloved son in you I am well pleased. Interesting that the first occurrence in the first three gospel accounts has to do with the love between father and son, just like in chapter 22. Well, what about in John? When is the first time love spoken of in John? The most famous verse in the Bible. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in it should not perish but have everlasting life. Three times it tells us he shouts from the heavens, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the son whom he loves. And then all of a sudden, boom, right here, the love that he has for his son and yet he's willing to give his son because that's how much he loves us, the world. Ephesians 2.4, his great love, that's where it comes from. There's no greater love. There's no more precious commodity in the whole universe than the blood of his son that he gives for who? For payment. For the world. Why? Because that's how much he loves us. That's how much he loves us. How great is that love? John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. There's no greater love than that. Jesus laying down his life for us, th th there's no greater love than that. Genesis 22, again, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, to the land of Moriah. Again, Moriah is in 2 Chronicles 3, one the place where, uh, you know, Solomon builds the temple. And that is the place, the exact place that, that God is going to sacrifice his son 2,000 years later. So Abraham is to take his son, his only son who he loves, kill him as a sacrifice to God. Now, how old is Isaac? How old is Isaac? Some say he's a teenager. I think this is wrong for two reasons. For one, to bring clarity of the type of Abraham being the type of God the Father. Isaac is a type of God the Son. How old was Jesus when he was crucified? 32, 33. So I would submit to you that Isaac was around that age as well. Second reason I don't think Isaac was a teenager is that, well, that wouldn't be much of a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, now you're awake. That's funny right there. My kids didn't like that until they became 20, 25. Now they think it's hilarious. <laughs> Both reasons are sound, if you ask me. So just understand what we have read in Ephesians 2, 4. This great love. Getting back here to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. That's how much he loved us. We didn't deserve it, but that's how much he loved us. And Jesus is a gift. It's not of works. You can't earn your salvation or you'd boast about it, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship because of what he has done for us, because we have received his grace, his gift. This is what he has now done for us. Guess what he has created in this workmanship that we should do good works. God prepared this beforehand. We're supposed to walk in this. The word workmanship in the Greek is poema. It means thing that is made a manufactured product. In other words, our conversion is not the end. It's the beginning of what it is that God wants us to do. And by doing this, it's going to help us be made in the image of his son. For what purpose? Good works. These good works is in contrast to verse 2, works of darkness. We're not saved by our good works. We are saved by the good work of Christ on the cross. But good works we know do not save you, but the saved do good works. 
Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Saving faith should result in a changed life. And people should see the good works. They should see the light. And that's what advances the kingdom of God and brings him glory. My identity, my identity is in Christ. That's my identity now. I've received Jesus. My whole person should be, people should know he's a Christian. He identifies as someone in Christ. It's very sad. I hope Jeff has never done this before, but I have, where I've done a memorial service for someone, their family, and everybody tells me they're a believer in Jesus Christ. I come from that point of view only to find out afterwards that someone says, man, I worked with a guy for 30 years. I didn't know he's a believer. Really? Shame on him. Whether he's up in heaven or not, I have, I have no idea. I guess he was a secret agent for the Lord or whatever, but it's kind of like, dude, your rewards are bupkis if you were a believer in Jesus Christ. If you've been around people six months or longer, I'm here to tell you, they should know you're a believer in Jesus Christ. They should know that you identify in Christ. It's interesting how many people we know, oh, big Avs fan. By the way, went in the Stanley Cup. Woo, good job. Oh, big Broncos fan, big this fan, big that fan. Is that, is that your identity? Is your sports affiliation? Big, big cross country guy, big this. Is that your identity? Is recreation? What is your identity? As a believer in Jesus Christ, your identity is in Christ. He goes on. And as you read about your identity in Christ in several areas of scripture, you find out your identity is to do certain things, being that you're in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 9, 8, my identity in Christ is to abound in every good work. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work work. If God is calling me to a good work, I have the abundance to be able to carry that out. He is not going to call me to something he's not going to enable me to do. My identity in Christ is to be fruitful to every good work. Colossians 1.10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. My, inde- my identity in Christ is to know the Bible is to know the word of God so I can be equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. My identity in Christ is to be zealous for good works. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope, glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ that comes at the rapture. We're looking forward to that. This is going to be wonderful. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I identify in Christ and I should be zealous to be able to help others to do good works. My identity in Christ is to offer up spiritual sacrifice to God through good works. Hebrews 13, 16. But do not forget to do good, to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You want to please God? Sacrifice yourself in doing something for someone else. That pleases God. And in my identity in Christ, I should be doing that. My identity in Christ is not to do these good works in the flesh, but to allow God to work through me Using the Holy Spirit, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works both in you uh, to will and to do for his good pleasure. My identity in Christ through good works is a testimony to the lost that win us the right to be heard. 1 Peter 2.12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so we, we, we can ask yourself, well, what are good works? 
Think of it this way. What would you like for someone to do for you? Do that for them. You know, you get snow here, help somebody, you know, shovel their driveway. They might be old. They might be infirmed. You know, they, they might have really young kids. They can't really put them to forced labor yet. You know, <laughs> so you, you go and, and help them out. You, you know, the, the leaves are piling up. You go and help rake their leaves. I mean, there, there are so many things you can do. You, you can be at Walmart and you can really tell those who are really struggling, especially now with inflation and everything else. You see it. Yeah, there's probably about 100 bucks worth of groceries there. I'm going to blow their mind right now. You see this woman, 14 kids in tow. You know, you go, I, I bet you'd appreciate someone just buying those $100. God has blessed me. I'm just going, hey, I just want to let you know God loves you. I am doing this for you. I want no arguments. Let me pay for this. Sometimes you're, you're, you're at Starbucks in line saying, I want, to, I want to pay for the person behind me, you know. My son got blessed that way. He was in, in at Starbucks and he was just ordering a, a beverage. This is like four years ago. And, uh, you know, it's like six bucks. So, you know, he's paying six bucks for a Starbucks or whatever. And, and uh, the lady said, no, the person in front of you bought that for you. And so he's going, no way. He goes, okay, I want to pay for the person behind me. And they said, okay, that'll be $46. He's going, whoa, whoa. Oh, man. I, you know, well, all right. That, those things happen. You know, God will bless you. You know, he goes, Dad, I actually checked. Yeah, she was in a van, but she was by herself. I, I didn't think. I said, well, she's probably picking up for somebody else. That's just God checking your heart, you know. But, but you can do that. You could be at Culver's or Freddy's or something like that, and you could just see. You can tell when it'll be a blessing. You just want to bless someone, you know. You can see what they drove up in. You could see that this is probably a special thing for them to take their family out and to be able to say, I just want to be able to bless you. Some of you in that financial position, you could do that. And it's a tremendous blessing. I think God loves that. Don't forget that greatest command. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great command. The second one is like it. Guess what? Love your neighbor as yourself. You first love God, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. These are good works. These are good things. My identity in Christ is to do good works However, before that, my identity in Christ is that I am a Christian. My identity is Christ. I want people to know I am a Christian. Now, critical race theory. Only took me, what, 45 minutes to get there? It's the fastest I've ever done that. You're lucky. The largest Protestant denomination in the United States, the Southern Baptist Convention, officially adopted critical race theory. Now, I'm going to explain what that is here in a moment. Okay, so just so you know, if you don't know what that is, don't feel bad. You know, until it was explained to me, I didn't know what it was either. So, okay, so I'm going to explain what that is. They adopted critical race theory and intersectionality as analytical tools to be used in fostering racial reconciliation in the church. Dave, what's wrong with that? Sounds like they're trying to do good work. You just said that we should do work, good works. Okay. Critical race theory, also known as CRT. That's just the abbreviation. Teaches that America culture is rife with white supremacy and racism and is used often subconsciously to hold women and people of color and people of different sexual orientation back. CRT doesn't depend on personal feeling or personal responsibility. It's based solely on the group that you were born into. That's the basis of it all. You had no choice. Whatever group you were born into, it completely eliminates individual sin or personal responsibility. You're just oppressive and wrong because of the class you were born into. Based on how you were born, you're either an oppressor or the oppressed. Those are the only two groups that there are. The oppressed and the oppressor. By the way, just so you know, that is the tenets, the principles, the foundation of Marxism. Cultural Marxism is to make you woke, to bring attention, to wake you up to the oppressor and the oppressed. 
The oppressor is the one born into privilege. The oppressed are those not born in privilege. And they're the ones that get to define the terms of who the oppressor is and the oppressed. Today, the woke Marxist tells us the majority groups are the oppressors. The minority groups are the oppressed. So if you're born white, which is the majority in the United States, then you're born with privilege. You're the oppressor. And if you're a minority, say if you're black, then you're oppressed and underprivileged. Heterosexuals are the majority. So they're automatically the oppressors over the minority of the LGBTQ who are the oppressed. Since the family unit of marriage between man and wife and raising kids in that family construct is the majority, then raising a family construct that's different from that is the minority and being oppressed by the traditional family unit. This is why the LGBTQ community is so entrenched in the Black Lives Matter movement. And why this movement used to have on their website the goal of destroying the traditional family values of father and mother. Author and pastor David Platt, who was, isn't anymore, he just stepped down about a year ago, um, just because his term was finished. Um, Pastor David Platt, who was the international missions president of the South Baptist Church, says that basically the evangelical church is propagating racism rather than helping to diminish it. He bases his understanding because he is bought into the critical race theory, this Marxist idea. So David Platt exhorts churches to repent of racism and to then set up multi-ethnic communities in order to achieve racial reconciliation. Sounds very nice, but that is not what the Bible says to do. You want to reconcile over here when you have to understand you've already been reconciled in Christ. And now you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And once you have been reconciled in Christ, guess what? There is no black, there is no white, there is no this. There's only Christian. Because your identity, whether you're black or white or whatever, is now Christian. My identity is in Christ. Galatians 3.26. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you were baptized into Christ and put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Just so you know, Greek means Gentile there, all right? There's only two groups of people in God's eyes. It was always the Jews and the Gentiles. If you don't know what a Gentile is, it's anyone who's not a Jew. Hey, I'm Latino. I get that. But you're still a Gentile. Hey, I'm this. I'm Irish. Okay, you're still a Gentile. Anything not Jew is a Gentile. Only two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. Guess what? They're eliminated in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. You're all one in Christ, in the church. There's all sorts of divisions out there. But Jesus has taken away all divisions in the church when you receive him The two, the divisions, whatever it is, you become one. What are you? Christian. My identity is in Christ. Go back to Ephesians 2. The rest of this chapter talks about how that division has been taken away. Verse 11. Therefore, remember, you, once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that's the Jews, made in flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world, that's where all the Gentiles were. But now you're in Christ. Now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, meaning the Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, Jew and Gentile. In the church, you're not a Christian Jew. And you're not a Christian Gentile. You're one. You're a Christian. You're a Christian and has broken down the middle wall 
of separation. Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself, in Jesus, one new man from the two, making peace. We're all the same. We're all believers. We're all Christians. We all have the same identity. We're in Christ. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. We're one. And my identity is in Christ, and so is yours. That's where your self-worth needs to come from. God sent his son to die for you. That means you're extremely valuable to him, and he wants to use you, which gives you purpose and meaning for the glory of God, as your identity is in Christ. He came, preached peace to you when you were far off, and to those who were near, meaning the Jews. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners. We're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, with all those who have gone before us. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Apostle Paul makes it very clear here that the, what the Gentiles didn't have, they now have in Christ. What the Jews didn't have, they now have in Christ. And they all have the same thing, Christ. Thus making one new man, we are one in Christ. There is no white Christian. There is no black Christian. There's just Christians. Christians that have been reconciled in Christ. You might be a Christian who's white, you might be a Christian who's Latino. You might be a Christian who's Asian. You might be a Christian who's Indian. You might be a Christian who's black. That's fine, but what are you first? Christian. You might be a Christian who's tall. You might be a Christian who's short. You might be a Christian who's bald. Okay, but you're just a Christian. Why do we put white, bald, tall before Christian? You might like being tall, that's fine. But you should like more being a Christian. You might like your ethnicity, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Love my Irish heritage. I'm talking metaphor, I'm not Irish. <laughs> you know, so whatever your ethnicity is, you might say, but I like that, that's fine. That's not a problem. Just don't be, that isn't the first thing that you should be giving of yourself. That shouldn't be the thing that you're proud of most about who you are, my heritage. Okay, where's Christ in that? Where's Christ in that? If being known for being white or black or Asian or tall is what you're putting out there before people know you're a Christian, shame on you. Shame on you. Your identity is in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. The Bible says we're reconciled in Christ. We don't need to achieve racial reconciliation. We need to have reconciliation with God. And once you have reconciliation with God, there is no racial tension in the church. Because you understand that brother, that sister is in Christ. This is what we have in common. And for me to be prejudiced because someone is taller than me, shorter than me, balder than me, blacker than me, whiter than me, shame on you. And I would say you're very immature in Christ. Because you cannot be mature in Christ and have any sort of prejudice. Unless you're a Raider fan. I'm still working on that. <laughs> still, I still have some issues, but I'm working on that. It's interesting because uh, we're very blessed at Calvary Castle Rock, as I'm sure you are here, that we have lots of missionaries that we support. There's many ministries that we support. 
But one of the ministries that we support is called Light of the World. It's a, it's a ministry that ministers to Haitians, and, and it's a ministry we have in Haiti, and we're trying to build a church there and doing all kinds of things. And so my wife and I um, were over uh, at this house of this woman that started Light of the World Ministries, her and her husband, and uh, this ministry to Haiti. And so she had her board there as well as some uh, two Haitians that were from the ministry there in Haiti. And so um, I'm looking around the table as we're praying. And this is what God has called to advance his kingdom in Haiti. I look around the woman who started it. She's from Minnesota. Okay, Minnesota. She's married to a Filipino man. They're the ones that have this heart for Haiti, a Minnesota and a Filipino. Have two Haitians that are there, both black and indigenous there. Then I look at my wife and I, about as white as you can get. And then the other two people that were on the board, Apache Indians. So you're calling three very white people, a Filipino person, two Haitians, and two Apache Indians. To advance your kingdom in Haiti. Okay. How do you do that? Because you're one in Christ, that's why. And I use my people to do that because you're one. Do you get that? Critical race theory, it's not fair. Don't give me that. Come to know Christ. I know Christ. We're now reconciled through Christ. Nothing more needs to happen there. Jesus did it all. Now let's walk together to continue to advance the kingdom of God. Do you get that? This is what God's word says. So when false teaching comes in, you measure it to the word of God. We have to reconcile the races. No, we don't. We need to reconcile people to Christ. And when you do that, the races are reconciled. God, others, not others, God, others. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation, we're told. Not to reconcile the races, to reconcile people to Christ. Because when you do that, guess what? The races are reconciled. All differences are reconciled when people come to Christ because your identity is in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I'm very, very grateful for your word, and I thank you so much for those that came out here tonight. And I just pray that we could be of one mind and one accord. And when people want to bring the problems of this world into the church, we could say, hey, that problem's already been taken care of through the person of Jesus Christ. And so if you want that to be taken care of in your life, give yourself to Christ and that will be taken care of. Father, I pray that people would know that we are, that our identity is in Christ, that we are a Christian and that you would use us to advance the kingdom of God and that our light would so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. We love you. We praise you. And we ask this in your son, Jesus name. Amen. All right, you can stand up. It's not, y'all. I don't know. What you're doing. Okay, so anyway, we're going to close in this song. Um, uh, you know, if you're a believer tonight, this is our hope. This is our prayer. Um, uh, excited about this day. Some bright morning when the scythe is over, I fly away to that on God's celestial shore.
shackles on my feet, yeah, I fly away, oh, I fly away, oh, glory, yeah, I, I fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I fly away, well, just a few more weary days and then, Yes, I fly away to a land where joy will never end. I fly away, yeah, sing. I fly away, oh glory, yeah, I fly away. And I die, hallelujah, by and by. All right. It has been a blessing to have Dave and Mindy here with us tonight. And um, we look forward to next week. We will have Gino Geraci with us. So that'll be a, an interesting time, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, you can ask Dave about Gino. Uh, now, he's a great brother in the Lord. And he was he came up, I think, before you, didn't he? Came up to uh, Littleton. And so Calvary Chapel, South Denver. And he... Hosts a radio program. Uh, he's on the board with, um, I'm spacing it out, the board for answer, God Answers, God Questions, God questions. GodQuestions.org. So very, very sharp guy, and look forward to what he has for us next week. And I hear one of our life groups is going to be doing the meal next week, Sloppy Joes and Filet Mignon. <laughs> No, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. So, no. Sloppy Joe's, I know that. So anyways, uh, let's close the word of prayer. And I know youth group, are they going to be going over there? Yep. So youth group can go over to the youth group room, the building behind me. So let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for this glorious day, this time together where we can worship you, lift your name up, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We thank you that we are one in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you for the message that we just heard. May your word just permeate our hearts, our minds, and may we walk in the truth of your goodness and grace. And Lord, we thank you for saving wretches like us and using us for your glory. And we just pray that you would continue to have uh, your hand upon Dave and Mindy and their family. Lord, bless them and encourage them as they continue to serve you and be a light and a witness to the people over in Castle Rock and wherever they go. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, Dave being here and sharing with, with us tonight. So, Lord, we give you all the glory for the great things you have done and are doing and will do in us and through us for the kingdom of God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said amen. 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 God bless you guys. High school, middle school, you may head over here. The rest of you guys, uh, God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus.